We often hear the word closure. Oh, we found the body, we're going to give them closure. You never have closure when you lose a loved one. The role of the investigator, especially the homicide investigator, is to give the family answers. Good evening, Australia. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael Kazilny, and this is Tough Times Never Last. Thank you very much for uh, watching all these years. If you're going through some difficult issues tonight, remember tomorrow's another day. Um, and uh, whatever you're going through, just go through it. Nothing lasts forever. On tonight's couch, we've got a really, really decent fella, Charlie Bazina, one of um, um, Victoria's uh, finest uh, homicide um, squad detectives. And in fact, he was in charge of the homicide squad. We've seen him around the media. He's a great helper, even though he retired in 2009. And uh, thank you very much for coming on, Charlie. I know you're a very... I hate that word busy, but busy man. <laughs> Pleasure, Michael. But Pleasure. I've always been a big fan because uh, I, I was squat 14 of 86 and I, I always, you know, used to look up to you guys. All oh, right. And and I remember, Charlie, I was um, uh, on the push bike patrol in, in Frankston when Paul Denyer was uh, doing yeah. all those murders. Yeah. And uh, I think he came down and spoke to us once at Frankston. Yeah, well, I was part of that investigation. Yeah. Uh, we did, uh, well, the, the team did the first one for Elizabeth uh, Stevens. That yeah. was the first one. Then, as we know, went to Debbie Freem and then Natalie Russell, the 17-year-old. And, uh, you know, that was a clear example of an investigation. And I often say that was an investigation solved by the community involvement. Mm -hmm. One lady made a phone call, and I keep emphasising it on the media appearances that I do. You know, so few, have met, so few police, but many of the community, and they need to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. That was solved by the lady making a phone call, having seen Denia's car, Three o'clock in the afternoon. And just summarising that case for the viewers who, who are a bit younger, uh, Paul Denyer was a serial killer in Frankston in 1995? 93. And 93 and, and, and killed, what, four or five? Three, uh, three women. Yeah. Um, and just uh, inexplicable, no connections. Uh, Elizabeth Stevens was the first one, 18-year-old young lady, mm. going to Frankston TAFE, uh, mm. saw her get off a bus, uh, stalked her, and then uh, ended up uh, killing her. Again, we had no idea, so that was my first investigation to start that one off. Mm. Um, and then that one led into probably uh, a week or two later, the young mother, Debbie Freem. Mm. She went to the milk bar. Um, he saw the car there and uh, he hopped in the back seat. He's a very obese guy, 21-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, hopped in the back seat. Uh, she got in the back seat, uh, put a knife to her throat, made a drive to an isolated location, again killed her. And that's when we really knew that we may have a serial killer on our hands. Oh. Whilst we're trying to keep the public calm as best we can, uh, because we knew there were similar wounds to the uh, two bodies, um, I had no idea. So we had two teams, my team running the first one, Elizabeth, another team running on uh, Debbie Freem. Uh, and again, we're just trying to find and work our way back is to try and find who was responsible for this. Mm. So whilst we're working full steam ahead, um, probably a week or so later, another couple of weeks later, um, a uh, young 17-year-old, Natalie Russell, uh, is reported missing. Mm. Her body is then found uh, between the two golf courses uh, off Sky Road. Mm. Um, and then uh, we had, a, that was a breakthrough. Charlie, I'll tell I, I just, um I was working the van and, and I uh, attended a job in Claude Street where um, we just got back from McDonald's and somebody reported some dead cats. And when we got it, got there, um, there was all the blood on the mm, walls. And, that's right. And it, it, that's right, because that was part of uh, Paul Denyer's work, that wasn't was it? That was Denyer. Uh, um, yeah. and, and, and shortly afterwards, I got into the push bike patrol and I actually lived in Franks North, just where, where, that, uh, where, where she was killed. And, and I remember um, seeing the car and... I think it didn't have any number plates Correct. on it, Correct. and we actually spoke to him, and uh, and and uh, yeah, I remember that, and it ended up being Paul yeah. Denya. Yeah, but oh, right. uh, it's so, amazing how you guys put it all together, and and then when when you did a raid at his house, yep. um, you found certain things, didn't you? Yeah, we found uh, incriminating things because he, well, he it was amazing. You know, this, um, Rod Wilson did uh, the interview. Uh, he's now a, a superintendent, still in the police force, and um, he made a, a denials. The interesting thing with Denya, he put himself at every crime scene, whilst denying it, because he was smart enough to know, because he was a very big guy, 21-year-old, 
uh, that uh, if someone had seen him, he said, well, I, I told you I was there. I was happened to be walking past. Too much of a coincidence. Um, so after the, the two or three hours of interview, denial, 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 no, it wasn't there, wasn't me, wasn't me, um, they uh, had a break and uh, we wanted to do a forensic procedure. We wanted to get him medically examined. We wanted to take a blood sample, a hair sample. Uh, we had to adjourn uh, on, and uh, the interview to ask for the doctor to arrive. And inexplicably, I think he knew, he knew that, uh, uh, that something might link him to one of the crime scenes. So in that break, he inexplicably saw another detective, had a crucifix around his neck, and he said, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am. And he said, I did the three of them. Just like that. That's an amazing. And uh, back they went. He made full admissions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did a full reenactment. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, whilst we could tie him to the Natalie Russell, there was a, a, a DNA link to Natalie Russell's body. We really had no link to the other two bodies. You know, the similar fact evidence in the wounds to the neck may not have been enough to charge him. But, look, he pleaded guilty. Um, initially got life imprisonment, no minimum which was great, mm -hmm. but, as you would know, precedent, because he pleaded guilty, he should have got a discount. Mm. So they appealed it. He got a, uh, uh, won the appeal, and the uh, full Supreme Court uh, said, OK, life imprisonment with a minimum of 30 years. But the, I suppose the, um, the worrying bit with that is, he's due for a parole when he's 51. Mm. And the psychiatrist and psychologist said at the Supreme Court trial, this guy will always want to kill. He's mm. always had the urge to kill since he was 17. Mm. He'll come out as a female, though, won't he? Exactly. Mm. No one, you can't talk to him unless you address him as Pauline. Mm. Um, he was dressing as a woman, mm. getting makeup brought into him by the guards and that type of thing. So, you know, there's another example of, okay, like um, uh, Julian Knight, mm. the recent example of, um, of the Ross Street bomber, Minogue. That type of thing. They've done their minimum. Mm. They've done everything right. Mm. And then legislation has to be then enacted to keep them in jail to keep the community safe. Because they're just not wide right, are they, Charlie? What an amazing right. career. We'll, we'll have a short break and then uh, ask you about how you got into that career. But uh, don't go away, folks, with the great man Charlie Bazine on the couch. Uh, 17 years at the uh, Victoria Homicide Squad. We'll be back shortly. Tough times never last with uh, Charlie Bazzino on the couch. And uh, uh, it's difficult, you could say, to join any police force around Australia. But once you become a detective, it's even more difficult. But one of the toughest squads uh, in any police force around the world is the Homicide Squad. Uh, it takes certain courage. It takes certain resilience and uh, mental toughness because uh, at any time, uh, the leader of that such a, a squad has to have um, uh, be ready in crisis, and and you're a very very tough um, minded person, Charlie. It's just a matter of being tough minded, you know. I'm very um, very connected to the community. You know, we yeah. all live in the community. There's a lot of police officers are. Yeah. You know, and that's why you're very um, very linked to that, and and you know you know that the buck stops with you. Just uh, in, in summary, in a nutshell, why did you join the police force? How old were you? And uh... Well, in a nutshell, I wanted to join the police force since I was a 15-year-old. Yeah. I was at secondary school, Sunshine Tech, and uh, I used to grow up, and I think uh, same as a lot of other uh, members, watching the homicide program with George Mallaby and yeah. that type of thing, Leonard Teal. Um, that uh, attracted me, Division 4, those police programs. Yeah. And I didn't want a... I didn't want, want a... Um, and they were a factory work job or mm. something as mundane, mm. I found that very challenging. And not in the wildest dreams that I'd say, well, you know what, I want to end up in the homicide squad. Mm. It was just an evolution as time joined. Mm. So I uh, joined the police force, and there was not many, very many ethnics I was in just the police say force. That, yeah. uh, I was very, uh, one of the very few. Yeah. Because uh, many years ago, it was very um, closed shop. Well, mm. certainly the homicide squad was very close. It was very mm. uh, mason orientated. Mm. Um, but I joined as a young uh, a, a police cadet mm. in uh, '72, mm. um, and then uh, did my time. I finished uh, Form Five, 
and then basically worked in the western suburbs and then as things went, went to Footscray CIB, Footscray Uniform, mm. spent about 10 years at Footscray. Mm. You know, uh, best part of the life was basically in the western suburbs where you cut your teeth, but different policing. Mm. You know, we'd worked at Divisional Van 1 Up. Mm. In those days, you look at it in the 70s, we weren't permitted to show any firearms. We had to carry a firearm in the pocket. Mm -hmm. It had a holster the pocket. The old pancake holster. That's right. So we had the old 32s, all war surplus for mm. 32s. Mm. Um, so, you know, you cut your teeth on that. You'd work divisional van on your own. 18-year-old, mm -hmm. uh, bang, you're out there and away you go. So really it was a great learning ground. Mm. And then from that it just uh, generated and then I got promoted to sergeant. Um, and then uh, went into the um, internal investigations department. Uh, spent 12 months there running investigations and surveillance. Uh, wow. That's so, another story in itself. Yeah, well, the hardest thing is, you know, mm. chasing uh, chasing the bad coppers. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, there's, there's corruption everywhere, mm. no matter what you do. But um, So I spent 12 months there and then uh, went three years in the drug squad, did some undercover work mm -hmm. in there. And the uh, audience might know it. One of my uh, conquests there was uh, the old VFA uh, footballer, Fred Cook. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, it, yeah, it, there's a lot of uh, situations where you... You get a relationship, professional relationship with with offenders, mm. and I and poor old Fred. I, I was working undercover buying uh, amphetamines off Fred, and to go to go from a place where he was, he had the keys of Port Melbourne. He was absolute king at Port Melbourne, had a hotel down in the station hotel, and then I got introduced to him by a drug dealer, um, mm. and I started buying drugs. He was in a shop, a disused shop, selling stolen video players, and to see this man coming from where he had from, from being so highly respected as a footballer in Port Melbourne to this back shop. He was actually using drugs, as was his partner. Uh, bought a number of drugs off him, and then uh, ultimately I was sold out by the person who introduced me, and Fred was told that uh, I was an uh, undercover police officer. So uh, Fred and I then had a couple of words, so I left. We arrested him the next day. Um, that's a sad case, you know, and mm. that's, that's just that just illustrates mm. the devastation mm. of what drugs do to you, mm. you know, such a great man as that. And then he went downhill after that again and had a few other issues and um, so uh, that went on. So the three and a half years there, got a little bit despondent in relation to having the resources to go up the tree and get the, the importer. Mm -hmm. They were happy, it was a figures game, we were charging people for drug trafficking, we'd buy, we'd spend probably forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 buying heroin. We started buying uh, heroin off the Romanians, that type of thing. So that was all good stuff, exciting stuff. But, you know, I didn't think we were making much of a dent. Mm -hmm. So uh, did three years there and then an opportunity came up uh, for the Homicide Squad. Mm. So uh, I put in for that uh, and eventually got it as a detective sergeant and then uh, spent uh, 17 years there. I left short for a short period in 95, got promoted to senior sergeant back out in the western suburbs. Couldn't get back quick enough uh, and then remained there until such time uh, as I left. We were rotated out of the squad. Uh, myself, Roly Leg, Lucio Rovis, uh, Ron Idles was there and um, uh, Jeff Ma. Because you guys all became sort of ce celebrities uh, in the media, didn't you? Um, because the, the squad was there for quite some time. Um, Charlie, I was going to ask you, um, I remember working at Frankston Police Station uh, one time in Davie Street and... Uh, I think Sarah McDermott went missing, you worked on and that. I know you worked on that. Mm. But I think around about the same time at the, uh, you know, where the CIB office yep. was at Frankston. Yep. I think a lady called Michelle Brown, Brown was also Postage. killed, yep. and, and and her sister was in the job at Frankston. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I remember the remember the yeah. Brown case. Um, and then that's interesting too, because we certainly did look at uh, Denya mm. for the McDermott case. And again, you know, the harrowing bit about that is every twelve months. And having that relationship, uh, and that investigation is still live. It's still live, you know. Uh, and you know, the pleas I would make uh, during my time in part of the investigation was saying, "Well, look, I don't care if I got an anonymous phone call, just tell me where the body is." Yeah. Now the family go to the car park of the Canuck Railway Station. There's a plaque there, mm -hmm. and that's where they can remember Sarah. And and how sad is that? You know, uh, and mm. uh, you know, not being able to lay her to rest anywhere. Hmm. And it's one of those mysteries. We had a lot of suspects. We then had a task force thereafter. It was one of the most investigated investigations that we had in the squad. Um, but then you just denied it, did he? He absolutely. was asked about it. Absolutely. And, and yeah. interestingly enough, he was so open with the three that he did kill mm. and the fact of his, uh, his issues about mm. uh, 
always wanting to kill women, um, there'd be no reason why he would not admit to mm. Sarah McDermott no. or even Michelle Brown, mm. you know, because, you know, just looking at the person, and there certainly had a lot of visitations in uh, in jail when he was in. Mm -hmm. There'd be no reason he was doing life, and even if we changed another two murders, it wouldn't have increased the penalty no. at all. So, you know, I was pretty confident, and I think other investigators were, that, um, that he wasn't responsible for Sarah no. McDermott. So... Unfortunately, um, it's just one of those things and you work as hard as you can. And one of my big thing is uh, I, I never say to families, I'm going to give you closure. We often hear the word closure. Oh, we found the body, we're going to give them closure. You never have closure when you lose a loved one. Mm. The role of the investigator, especially the homicide investigator, is to give the family answers. They want to know why was their loved one murdered? Why were they the ones that actually had to lose their life? And we would go back to them and say, well, your son was murdered because he was involved with drugs, and they might not be aware of it. They're getting answers. They need to know reasons why. Mm. And then you, have, you build that relationship. And unlike the TV programs, you know, I think one year there I was running at least on my team uh, probably 10 or 14 live investigations apart from the unsolved cases, apart from running court appearances. We might have a quick break and, and uh, find out about those, but that's, what an amazing life. We'll be back very shortly on Tough Times Never Last. And thank you very much for watching. I'm Michael Gazzilni. Tough times never last. Uh, wherever you are in Australia, if you're going through some difficult issues, um, um, do just that. Go through them uh, because uh, things will get much better. Uh, Charlie Bozina, um, top homicide squad detective, 17 years in Victoria's homicide squad, investigated more than 300 suspicious, suspicious deaths, including 150 murders. Uh, uh, Paul Denyer and, of course, gangland figure Alfonso Gangatano. That's an in interesting one. And uh, and Paul Silky in uh, South Road as well. Mm, mm. I worked with Silky back in St Kilda. He was a good man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, Alfonso, you know, what, uh, what, what what happened there? <laughs> uh, well, it, I think he had a fallout and uh, I just fell short and be able to prove it. And I was convinced that Jason Moran was the shooter. Yeah. Uh, and how the investigation then ran, I think ultimately they were actually on bail at the time, they being Jason Moran and Alphonse, for the King Street uh, night. Uh, they were in a brawl in a, in a billiard parlour and they were yeah. both on bail for that. And I think the situation was Alphonse was going to put up his hand uh, and uh, make admissions to some sort, which did uh, displease uh, Jason. One thing led to another. Uh, interestingly, again, these old names, J Graham Kinneborough was at the home at the time yeah, right. of, the, uh, of his murder, uh, but he absent, absent himself uh, out, he says, after the murder, or oh, speaking about before the murder, but I'd say he was still present at the time of the murder. Jason arrived, Jason kills uh, Alphonse, he then leaves. We actually get the, got the driver who drove Jason to the location then drove Jason over the Westgate Bridge, the pistol went into the river, uh, the Rabarong River, or the Arrow River, sorry, um, and then we never found it, unfortunately. It just fell short. But the inquest uh, did find that Jason Moran and Graham Kinnebrough were implicit in the death of Alphonse Kenzatano. Whilst it's not solved, uh, I was happy of that case. They've now, they've now been uh, part of the underworld murders. Um, so, again, it's, you know, it's, I suppose, the same ilk fighting each other as the underworld murders were. I was just thinking, Charlie, the underworld um, murders, was there 17 or...? Yeah, about that. And, yeah, and, I wasn't uh, involved in it, but... Uh, no, it, yeah. was it um, after your time or...? No, 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 I was there during, but I wasn't part of the task force. No. So the task force was running separate yeah. to us and I was just yeah. still responding to the, on, yeah. the ongoing jobs. One of the main ones, uh, with these high-profile ones, was the... Um, the uh, double murder of the police informants, the Hodsons, mm. if you remember that, where oh, Paul yes. Dale and there. Uh, uh, was uh, involved and mm. David Michel. Oh, my God. Uh, that type of stuff. So that was, um, you know, significant in itself. Again, um, uh, it was uh, one of those sad ones where these husband and wife were police informers mm. and the same deal and a lot of police corruption allegedly involved. As David Michel was, in fact, uh, charged with doing the burglary with with uh, uh, the Hudson mm. uh, and that type of stuff. So they were high profile as they went. So that one, they remained within the squad before it became a part of the task mm. force. So that went on and on and on. And unfortunately, uh, 
I think they end up charging someone after my time. But uh, again, these high-profile ones and things have now mellowed out. And you know, but I think you know there's a lull in proceedings and the apprenticeship of these the family of the deceased underworld figures are now growing up, mm -hmm. and that will be the next way that'll happen. Oh my God! You know, and that's there is apprenticeship. And Charlie, when you were in the tow cut, as the uh, uh, ethical standards there, did mm. you um, did you uh, um, were you surprised to, with um, what you found? Oh, I suppose it was a short time there. Yeah. But were you surprised at um, discovering that maybe one of your ex colleagues or someone you knew was a crook? Not really. Um, look, there wasn't endemic uh, corruption when mm. I was there as such. You know, mm. the Paul Higgins of the world was mm -hmm. running the prostitutes and that type of thing, and mm -hmm. you know he's uh, since uh, passed. Um, and that type of thing, or the even Bertrand Wainer with the abortions, mm. there wasn't that when I was there in uh, uh, just prior to the uh, mid eighties. Mm. Um, you know, when we were dealing with with uh, with a particular officer, who was a pedophile, for example, and then we identified a pedophile ring with other police officers, um, other ones who were doing um, uh, stealing and that type of stuff. So when you talk about endemic corruption, mm. I, I didn't see that at the time that I was there. But, you know, now there's been police officers charged with drug dealing, drug mm. trafficking and the likes. Uh, one of my um, ex-work uh, colleagues when I was in a drug squad, uh, uh, a Strawhorn, who, uh, mm. who got uh, sent to jail and that type of stuff. It's a matter of, you know, uh, I suppose an opportunity arrives there's a jealousy thing of saying, well, look, and they're offered money. Mm. You know, it's your, your, your career, your superannuation and your family are just not worth it. No. So ultimately, it's like New no. South Wales. They started paying them a lot more. Mm. But, uh, you know, the straight shooters and there's and 98%, you know, we are the cleanest police force, as far as I'm mm. concerned, with, throughout Australia. Mm. Um, and you'll never stop corruption. It's a human element. Uh, there's greed. Uh, there's every other reason for it. Um, you try and keep them honest because one will bring the other ones down. So that's where I suppose there's a place for uh, the internal investigations now called professional standards mm. to give a person, I suppose, an avenue to complain and say, well, this police officer did this and this and that. But I think policing it today have become very timid. Mm. You know, you see the policing and, you know, uh, I suppose in the 70s, uh, you know, we'd, uh, we'd uh, I suppose, I'll fondly say that policing was a contact sport in the 70s. Uh, and we worked under the adage that uh, you know you you came in here with good with uh, good looks and information and you can't leave with both. So it was a hard, and there was a fear factor. Mm -hmm. Police had that fear factor, mm. and we lost it. Mm. You know now we've had, and it's, it's sadly I think there was two or three within this last week that that uh, 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 shots have been fired at police. Mm. That's a worrying thing. They're prepared to do that and shoot at police. Mm. You know it's unheard of. This is Victoria, mm. but we are getting into that realm which is worrying. So they'll shoot at police, what will they do to the community? Mm. We've got the, the problem with firearms on the street, pistols being imported as much as drugs are. It's a big issue for us. But the message I'd like to give to everybody is, you know, you've got to support the police. You've got to be part of the solution. It's always been my catchphrase. And, you know, everything is confidential. Sure, you don't have to make a statement. However, we need to solve this together and we'll get there. Charlie Bazina, thank you very much for coming on. You're a great man. I honour and respect you. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I honour and respect you too. Love and best wishes. I'm Michael Kazilny and we'll see you next week. Good night.